All right. Hello and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM coming to you from the lovely San Diego as usual. And today I am joined by Deb Bolkis, who is in an equally lovely Florida today. How are you doing, Deb? I am wonderful. How are you today? Great. And Deb is an author, keynote speaker, symposium producer and founder of Business World rising where she has developed her own unique sense of leadership style and, and rose up through the ranks in your career and developed your own leadership style. And today what we want to talk about is how to create a best place to work culture. So Deb, um, as you went through your career, what are some of the things you saw that, that prompted you to feel, okay, this can be done in a better way? Well, I'll tell you, I had, um, in 30 years in Fortune 100 companies, I mm -hmm. probably had about as many managers, probably 30. Um, nice. Some of them were terrific. Some of them were, I can point to and say they were the best boss I ever had. And others taught me a lot about what not to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, along the way, after looking at, um, as every company must, you, you have to be profitable. And you yeah. do need to measure and make sure that you're attaining your objectives. But uh, I found that the organizations that worked really well, and mine normally did because I focused on building relationships with the people in the organization who reported to me, who were around me, who we interfaced with inside and outside the company. And so it was really about more about relationships. And if you do the right things for the people working for you, the numbers somehow magically make themselves. <laughs> and so, um, so what, are some of the, uh, what are some of the ways that you approach it that you would say maybe is slightly different from maybe how a lot of traditional people approach their leadership styles? Well, one of the things I like to do is really know the people that work for me and I want them to really know me, authentic me, not the me I am different at home or a different person mm -hmm. at work. I think it's important that you're the same person all the time. So people know what to expect. But I also like to know what, what does success mean to the people who report to me? Because we don't all have the same version of success. And especially for those of us who are in sales, as I was, you probably were, most of yeah. you were. Uh, it's not really necessarily about as long as I make my numbers, as long as I get my bonus, I'm a happy camper. Uh, that's not necessarily what makes people happy. That will certainly drive you and it will, it will bias mm -hmm. how they behave. But I want people to be working towards something and doing something every day that they love to do. And I right. found inevitably throughout the career uh, that I had in the Fortune 100 environment, when we had challenges with employees, when you got down to having that heart-to-heart -heart conversation with that individual, they were normally doing something they really didn't enjoy. Mm -hmm. And so if you can have those conversations all along the way, and when you see things that are starting to slide, have that conversation with them, tell me how things are going. And right. sometimes they'll tell you and sometimes they won't, but when you can ask them, you know, if you were doing anything else, what would that look like? Yeah, because there's one, uh, there's, a, there's a trap that, uh, that a lot of people fall into, and it's almost something that we've been almost taught to do traditionally when you're coming up to the ranks of management. And, you know, it's, that, it's, it's, like, the, it's like the annual performance appraisal, for instance, right? And you, I bring you in and I maybe say, oh, yeah, Deb, you're doing well. And maybe I have one thing that you're doing well at, but I have all these other areas for development and things that you're not doing so well that we want to work on improving this year. And we here, we, we follow the Friedman Malik uh, management principles. It's about, you know, focus on what people are doing well. And in fact, try and build their job around the things they do well, because guess what? The things that they don't do well, probably never going to do well. And uh, they're not going to be happy if even trying to do those things better but it does seem that we fall into that trap all the time of of focusing on the things that need fixing rather than accentuating the things that are, are where the people really have skill yeah we certainly do and also when you've got uh, job openings we tend to fall into the trap of trying to put square holes mm -hmm. or round peg in a square hole trying to say okay these are the job requirements 
can you do this? Oh, yes, I can do this. Well, maybe they can do this, but it doesn't mean they're going to love to do it. Right, right, right. And it is, yes. Yeah, so, and so we end up then fitting, we end up, um, as you say, fitting the person to the role as opposed to looking at the role and really finding the right person for that or taking the person and figuring out what they are good at and building that role that actually works, you know, that you can get the maximum out of them. Absolutely. Spot yeah. on. So what are the bigger, what are the challenges that you see nowadays? Because one of the things that a lot of organizations are facing with, and and we deliberately here have done it ourselves on the pipeliner side, is that uh, our organization is much more dispersed, remote. Uh, we be, we don't really believe in necessarily having physical buildings, you know, where it makes sense, sure. But we're more about having people live where they want and you're know, finding the best talent. And obviously, you've got the whole world at your disposal. Now, on the flip side of that, obviously, uh, building a cohesive culture, that raises its own challenge. And I mean, I think we've done a pretty, we feel we've done a pretty good job of it. But I think this is something, a challenge that's facing more and more organizations going forward, is how do you build a culture when you have so many hybrid working uh, situations? Yeah, absolutely. I think more and more, and especially the larger your company gets, uh, the more you are dealing with a remote management situation. And to make it even more complex, as uh, as the company grows, you probably have people who are not only working remotely from you in your country, but you have people in other countries. Yeah. You have mm-hmm. people from different cultures. And the interesting thing is when 40 years ago, most of us who worked in America were dealing with people who were born and raised in America. We all came from a very similar background, similar cultures. And we don't really realize that other cultures don't necessarily have the same beliefs, things that motivate Mm -hmm. them. Uh, And they don't understand when you say something, they may not interpret it the same way, even though you're saying the same words and everybody is nodding their head. Uh, So it, it can be a real challenge creating a cohesive organization when, especially when you have people in different countries or even just with diff- within different cultures within, within your community. So you have to make sure that you get people together from time to time uh, to the best that you can. Unfortunately, we have technologies like we're using today where you can actually mm-hmm. see each other. But you really have to get into more, sometimes more personal conversations to really make sure, did you hear what I said? What does that mean to you? Mm-hmm. And and on top of that, so I mean, you've got people dispersed throughout the world. You've got different cultures. Uh, uh, you have people. You know, there's a lot of uh, contractor work doing too. So I mean, you've got a lot of people who maybe will work with you for a period of time and then move on. But you've also you still got to integrate them for the period of time. And then we've got the, I think right now, like we, we've we've got the most um, generations in the workforce that's ever been. Right. So again, so it's it's kind of it goes broad and it goes deep too. Yes. So how, so what are some of the, cause I mean, cause a lot of times it's very tempting to fall into one communication style and just sort of broadcast and go, okay, you know, this is the way I communicate and I'll communicate with everybody this way, but that doesn't mm-hmm. really work, does it? No, it certainly doesn't. And in fact, I mean, I found even when you had people in your own office, mm-hmm. you had to find a way that worked for each individual in the organization. And this is where I tell managers all the time, You as the manager, you are the one who needs to flex. You are not the one who can sit back in your chair and demand, okay, everybody meet my style. You as the manager, if you want to get superb performance from your your team, you need to do what they're comfortable with. And sometimes you've got people that want to meet with you every Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning, (laughs) and I want to meet with you for 30 minutes, and I will give you my agenda, and this is what I want to talk about. And then you'll have other folks that, you know, they may be out working on projects. They're hardly ever available. They want to be able to call you up when they're driving Mm -hmm. to meet a customer or uh, you've got to figure out what is going to work for that individual. And as the manager, you've got to try to make yourself accessible to the furthest extent that you possibly can and communicate in the way that they're comfortable with. And it may be on the phone. It may be on video technology. It could be emails, but you've got to flex that way. Yeah, and that's an interest because it is it is very tempting to think, well, um, I'm the one in charge, so everybody flex to me, uh, as opposed to looking at it the other way around and saying, yeah, you know, I'm the one who's got to flex to to other people, uh, and especially nowadays, it's like, and as I said, with multi generational things, it's 
the style of communication. It's how they want to be communicated with. It's how people receive information. It's so uh, it can be so different. You can have four people, and you know you can take a, a four piece selection of four people, and you can have four different ways that they like to be communicated or like to receive information. And it's and obviously. As a leader, I mean, it's tough because, you know, maybe you have your own style bias. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's one of the neat things about your organization, Sales Pop. You learn when you're in sales, you as the salesperson, if you want to have superior performance, you want to delight your customer, you're going to communicate with that customer the way that they are most receptive to, right? Yeah. So you always have to look at yourself as that salesperson, no matter what you are doing. Yeah, I think that's a that's an excellent point uh, because it was one that was raised recently. Uh, somebody was telling me recently they were doing a ride along with the salesperson, and I just think this is a great like micro example. They're doing a ride along with the salesperson, and a text came through from that salesperson from a prospect or, or that they had, and it was a simple asking them a simple question. Salesperson immediately he didn't answer the text, hit call and call the person, right? The prospect. And the prospect basically didn't want to be called. They no. wanted an answer. And the, and <laughs> they, and the guy who was doing the ride, well, the guy who was doing the ride along said, he texted you and asked you a question. Why didn't you text the answer back? He said, well, it's much better if I could get, he said, yeah, but you weren't adapting to how that person wanted to be communicated with. Now you could have texted back saying, here's the answer to the question, but to give you a more detailed answer, perhaps we could get on the phone. You ask permission from it, but don't, but don't force somebody to communicate with you in the way that you want to. Yeah, absolutely. And I tell you, whenever you get a text from anyone, you have to think about where might they be? The reason they're texting yeah. me may be because there are 17 other people there and they need an answer and they don't even want to have anyone else know I'm asking you right now. Exactly, exactly. So I think that's a, a it's a good it's a good analogy to say. I mean, in, you know, you have to adapt when you're in sales to how the person, how the prospect, customer wants to be communicated with, and you should also you have to flex and adapt to how your you know your employees or your team members want to be uh, communicated with as well. So what are some other ways? I mean, communication is one, but what are some other ways that you can create a great work environment? Well, again, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the most important thing, I think, is to ask people what is it they really love to do. Mm -hmm. And it's important that everybody on the team understands who else is on my team and what do they love to do. And particularly, mm -hmm. you know, offer to help each other. Sometimes we get so heads down in the weeds of doing our own job, and you may be stuck on something. Uh, you might forget that there's somebody else in here in, in our team. You may not see them every day, so you might forget about them because they work someplace else. But sometimes that reaching out. And so as a manager, if you can remember to have some way that all of you communicate together at some point, whether it's once a month, twice a month, once a week, whatever works for your team. Um, to make sure that everyone on the team understands each other, understands the kinds of things that they're dealing with, the challenges that they have, and um, have that environment where they all feel comfortable brainstorming together and offering to help each other so that you know you're not alone, especially if you're not there together in the office. No, I think those are, I think that's a great point. And, and the, the other one that you mentioned earlier, I think is a great one to underline as well about the fact is, uh, you know, asking people what they like to do, but also asking them what they're, what they're, their motivation is like, why are they doing what they're doing? But, and the reason why sometimes that's a great question is there's a lot of people who actually haven't really thought it through. And if you ask, if you ask somebody say, you know, what, what is your motivation? What motivates you? Why are you doing this job? And what do you look and what are you looking to achieve? You know, some people will be able to tell you immediately what it is, but there's some people who need, who need to sort of go, Hmm, I need to think about that and get back to you. And I think it's something that is worth uncovering. Absolutely. And my, my favorite question to ask anyone, if I'm working with them in any way, is to ask them, what does success mean to you? And oftentimes people have never heard that question. They don't even know how to answer it. And I like to say, you know, it could be that you're working to your parents' version of success. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you yeah. were told a certain thing 25 years ago and you're still doing that because that's what they told you you should do or your wife or your husband or your brother or your sister. 
But, you know, what does success mean to you? And it's, it's interesting that so many people find themselves in a job they don't feel they can leave because the pay is good. So mm-hmm. I don't want to do anything to mess this up. But when you ask them, what would you really love to be doing? As you say, why are you doing this? A lot of times it's because the pay is good. But if you could say, you know what? You could get paid the same, maybe better. Mm-hmm. If one, if you love what you're doing. And two, if you're doing something you really love, and I would love to help you get there because maybe mm-hmm. we can do that right here. Maybe we can just kind of shift some things around mm-hmm. with other people in the organization. Maybe there's another department in the organization that you could do even more than you're doing now, something we don't even have anyone doing today. Right. But yeah. we could leverage that. So I love to have those conversations. And it is amazing how people get excited when all of a sudden they know they have the freedom to think outside the box and to tell you they want to do something that's outside of this box. Mm-hmm. And, 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 there's a, and I always think there's an interesting flip side to that, too, is also is that if you're if you're doing the job be, and you think and you're staying because of the pay or whatever, you like the conditions or, you, you know, it's close to where you live or whatever, whatever. There is, but it's not your dream. It's not your dream job or whatever. I think you also have an obligation to go, OK, I'm choosing this. Right. I'm choosing this because I like the pay. I like it being close. So therefore, um, I have to make some compromise. So therefore, I actually do owe them the best job I can do. And I don't owe them grumbling about the job because I'm making the choice. Yeah, It's interesting how many people forget that they actually don't have to go to this place to work every day. Yeah, the only exactly. one that makes them go do this job is themselves. Yep. And so when you can get them to step back and say, okay, <laughs> do I really yeah. want to be doing this? How would I change this? And if you as the manager can help them, help coach them through that conversation, it, it, mm-hmm. it turns your relationship into a, into a really exciting, exciting thing yeah. that maybe that person has never even experienced before. Exactly. Or maybe it's just a, it's just a great opportunity to remind them that suddenly actually you know, this is pretty good. What I have is pretty good and I maybe need to have a better attitude. So whichever way, everybody wins, right? It certainly could be. You know, uh, we had a uh, leadership development company in Southern California before mm-hmm. I came back here to Florida and senior leaders would pick individuals who they felt were high potential up and comers. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, they're not quite getting to that step that we really expect them to be. And, and we think they're great for the long haul. We're willing to invest in these individuals, but could you take them into your program and, and fix them? And mm-hmm. you'd say, fix them? What does fix them mean? Well, usually yeah. they didn't know. It's just, well, they're just not reaching their potential. So we want you to help them get there. And it's amazing how many times we would get those individuals in and they'd be kind of quiet. And eventually we'd have these conversations like you and I are just mm-hmm. talking about and you find out, well, you know what? It turns out this individual is in the accounting department and they've always really admired what goes on over in marketing and they sure wish that they could do that, but they're afraid to mm-hmm. say anything about it. Yeah. Well, I don't have a marketing background. Well, you know what? It may not matter because you really understand your company. You know what you do. Yeah. So when you can start having those dialogues about how can we morph you over here? I've had people who were this close to leaving a company even that are still there 15 years later because we got them down the right path that they weren't on in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's and it's this and this is where I always find it it's so challenging for young people. And we put this awful pressure on them, you know, when they're when they're going through school and that or whatever, and they're coming out and it's like, oh, you know, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do and study in college? And yeah, I mean, if you want to be a doctor or a dentist or a lawyer, that's pretty straightforward, right? You know. But for the vast majority of people, they don't really know. So they, you know, they go and they go do a degree. And to your point, sometimes sometimes you're in the workforce for 10 or 15 years or maybe even longer before you realize, wow, that's, that's what I want to do. And yeah, you may not have done a degree in it. You may not have the background, but you may absolutely have the aptitude for it. Absolutely. There you could have the aptitude and more important than anything is your attitude. Yeah. You know, if just yeah. making a tweak in, in what you do is going to change your attitude and make you a happy camper, it is worth it because mm-hmm. when you're not happy, you drag everybody else who's around you down with you. Again, when you're well, happy, that's you bring exactly. everybody else up. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, how often, how many times have you seen that when somebody changed their attitude or when somebody who is a bit of a dark cloud, when they leave the organization, the whole organization brightens? Absolutely. They, they cheer. <laughs> why did you wait yeah, so yeah, long? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And that's why I always say to people like when they're having, it's like um, when I advise, you know, people who are managers or leaders, especially when they're having struggling with an employee and they don't want to pull the, they don't want to pull the, the trigger on, okay, uh, uh, letting the person go or whatever, and they've tried everything. And I would say to them, actually, by keeping that person, you're being completely selfish. It's not you're being selfish and you're being disingenuous to them because clearly they're not going to make the decision, but you need to help them go fight to move on and find what's good for them. Because clearly this isn't good for them, but by just keeping it, keeping this going, you're just being selfish. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you the one thing I truly believe doing exactly that is a manager's number one most important job. Mm -hmm. is to make sure that you've got people in this organization who are loving what they're doing. And if they don't mix it up, change it, help that person find the right position somewhere else in your company or yeah. outside. Because a, exactly. believe me, they will thank you for it. What we think are difficult conversations. Oh my gosh, if this person's not doing well, I really don't want to talk to them about it. You yeah. have to. And this person yeah. might love you forever for helping yeah. them move on to something that will just change their life yeah. and change yours too, because it might actually give you now an open head count that you can go get somebody in here who's going to love this yeah. job. Yeah, and maybe they won't, and maybe they'll hold it against you forever. But the fact at the end of the day is, you know, is that as long as you do the right thing. And it's funny, and people think that, the, you know, maybe these are mistakes that lower manager or rookie managers make. But uh, Peter Drucker, in his research, he said the number one mistake even experienced executives uh, make is holding on to people too long. Yep. And not rectifying wrong hires quickly. Yeah, in the book, uh, one of the executives that we interview in the book, uh, The Wow Factor Workplace, talks about mm -hmm. hiring slow and firing fast. And it is really yeah. difficult to fire fast yeah. if you're the person that hired that individual because, as he said, mm -hmm. how can I be wrong? Well, you know what? Sometimes you are. <laughs> Yeah. You know, well, I, what I say, yeah, exactly. And what I say nowadays is I look back on my career and I say, listen, you can have the, you can have the most uh, complex, well thought out, well researched hiring process. You can go through all of this stuff, right? And you can, and you can, uh, and at the end of the day, it's still, it's still, there's a, still a level of a crapshoot about because you never really know people who they're in the job and whatever. And uh, and I say, as a result, I guarantee you, I can I can name some fantastic hires I made, but I tell you, the majority of them weren't. And that's just the reality. And I think once you realize that and to that point is, uh, you know, hire slowly, fire early. I mean, I think you just have to hold your hand up and say, yeah, well, you know, I thought this person was going to be great. They passed through all of these things. It all looked fantastic. But, you know, six months later, it just, for some reason, it didn't click. No, and you know what? Sometimes, I mean, life changes. It, it could have yeah. worked really well when a person first comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, but but life goes on. Business changes. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the goals and objectives of corporations can change. The who owns exactly. the company can change. And so you have to have an ongoing relationship and constantly looking at, am I still loving what I'm doing? Are you still loving what you're doing? What do we need to yeah. change? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, listen, Deb, this has been fantastic. Uh, we've, uh, we've bumped up against the end of our time. But before we go, can you tell people a little bit more about your organization and what you do? Yes, I am the founder of a company called Business World Rising. Uh, we focus on accelerating advancement for people into senior leadership and helping them build best places to work where people are going to love to be every day and you're going to have outstanding results. So I am a keynote speaker. I conduct symposiums for companies and we come in and consult with companies all the time. Fantastic. And if you click on Deb's bio uh, under this video, you'll be able to see all of that information and links to her website and her books and all that good stuff. So listen, Deb, thank you very much for joining me today. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.